when we chatted about a presentation or a, a discussion around scaling startups, it's tough because you're like, well, what, what are you talking about scaling? Like the team or the product or, um, and, and so what I decided I wanted to focus more in on was, um, was like kind of like the, the milestones, the things that make you realize you're on the right path. Because whenever I think about scaling, it's like you're going from this research, trying to figure things out, building cool, fun products, to this operations mode where you're bringing different types of people in and you're trying to grow it. But basically, you kind of have that product figured out. Um, one of the challenges I've always found, though, doing startups, I've, this is my sixth company I've started, uh, Markov, uh, has always been actually figuring out if you actually have the right product and you have the right customers and you're serving them well. Uh, and so I just wanted to show a little framework on, um, on how that works. And then I want to apply that framework to Clover. Uh, and then we can, we can just chat and, and, and talk more about that. So the, the first thing on the framework was, um, how essentially, how receptive are customers to even just talking about it and discussing it? And I don't mean like, um, oh, that's a really cool idea. Thanks for sharing it. Yeah, you have a great idea. But more like you're knocking on the doors of your customers and they're, and they're, um, they're intrigued and they're discussing their problems with you and you're seeing the fit of how your product works for that. And I know these are like very simple concepts and you get thrown a lot, but... Um, but sometimes it's the simple concepts that are the most important to keep your eye on. So the first checkpoint is just like, are you even having this real dialogue? Are you having like a rich dialogue with your customer? Uh, again, it's a little different for consumers versus enterprise, but regardless, how, how rich is this conversation? It doesn't mean you have the right product yet, um, but if, if you're like sending lots of messages out or you're sending up lots of conversations and you're just nothing's going on there, you really gotta shift like very quickly. You're not gonna, don't switch to scaling mode yet. <laughs> Um, the second is, okay, it seems like it's something, there's something there, you, you're, 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 you're discussing an idea that they're really interested in, but um, how, how easy is it for them to actually then just use it um, or implement it or, or, or move on to the next step? Uh, and so this picture I'm showing here is, is just as an example would be like if I were selling uh, uh, something that needs to be put into a car, right, uh, a new type of airbag. Think about the number of people that have to be involved in implementing putting a new airbag into a car's line. Like, it's just crazy. Not, not just like how you would do it, but all the people that probably would have to agree to it and get into that process. So, so a big part of it is like how easy is it, not just like your pro how easy is your product, but like how easy is it for the people you're selling to or the people you're asking to use the product to actually get it into use? Is it gonna take six months? Is it gonna take an hour? Um, and, and how quickly are they going to see the feedback of saying, oh, this worked for me or not? Is it going to take six months to figure out that it's working, or is it going to take them a few minutes to figure out it's working? And again, it depends on your product. Consumer is a little different than, than commercial. But, but this is a really important framework because um, sometimes you'll get in the door really easily. The customer will be like, this is fantastic. And you get in there, and like six months later, you're still kind of in this evaluation phase. And you're like, wait a minute. They're, they're still saying they're intrigued, but it's taking a really long time for them to roll it out. Um, um, now that's fine if there's like a hundred million dollar payday at the end of that because they're a huge customer, but for most startups, you can't wait the two or three years for that, that experience. All right, the last piece is um, very important for the venture capital community, but honestly, it's gotta be your like third checkpoint, um, and you really don't wanna think too much about this until you get here. So you may have actually very bad unit economics at the beginning as you're getting started, but then ultimately you have to actually care about your unit economics, right? Um, and so like, I love the Webvan one, although I lost a lot of money in Webvan, um, personally, but uh, apparently it works now. Uh, so I guess the unit economics now work, but they didn't work back then. And, um, and, and so like now that you have this thing where you've got this process where you have a funnel, you can talk to customers, you have this process where you're rolling it out, um, and you're seeing it's working and they're satisfied and happy, um, what's the total cost of all that? What's that whole thing look like? Um, and can you tweak the unit economics to get where you want? Okay, so this is the framework. Are they answering your calls? Are they talking to you? How hard is it for them to actually put it into to work? And then um, how much did that all cost you to make that happen? All right, so let's use Clover as an example. So Clover went through three acts. A lot of people like to describe when a company changes its approach as a pivot. Pivots usually mean you're still on one foot. Um, we blew our business up like three times, so I wouldn't call ours a pivot. Okay, act one, 
Clover Act One. We said, all right, we have this idea. We love what Groupon's doing with small businesses. It's getting them all these customers, but we don't like the mechanism of blasting emails out. It seems to be very sporadic. We're going to build an entire ad network with all this amazing targeting where basically you're just on the web browsing around, and every once in a while, a deal's going to come up that's specifically targeted at you, um, and it doesn't mean it's just for that day. You know, The next person might get it the next day and the next day, and so there's this nice steady stream of customers going to the small business. All of it was making a lot of sense. Let's go through our framework. So the first thing was, you know, were the customers receptive? Um, now, in this case, we kind of had two customers. The publishers, the people who were actually going to put this ad unit on their site, were they receptive? Yeah, they always want more ad revenue. So it was really easy to get conversations with them. Um, second, the small businesses. Were they receptive to essentially offering you know, deals or, or trying to do this? Yeah, they were always desperate for customers. So anytime you're building a product that gets people customers, it's like much easier. Like this step is the easy part. OK, is it easy to buy and use? Um, well, the way we designed it was it was this little widget that you just put a little piece of script on, in the footer. That meant that there was this like the one guy who always did the ad stuff. He always stuck in one by one pixels. Super easy. You gave him a little thing. S easy. So we were getting on all these sites. We had like about 4 million eyeballs on all these different sites. Very easy. OK, small business unit, uh, small business owner. Is it easy for them? Well. They're not putting any money out, right? They're deals. So they only have to pay when some cust new customer comes in, and then they're giving a discount. Last part, unit economics. Now, and we had a huge, like we built up a, a sales per force of 20 people in New York. It was the former Yelp guy who ran a, a chunk of Yelp sales. It was an amazing team. We had amazing deals. We just focused on New York. We had all the concentration we needed. We had an amazing data science team targeting awesome product. For basically, for every hundred dollars of ad inventory we used, meaning for our, if you thought about our pop-ups as using someone's ad inventory, we were generating about a dollar of revenue for the publisher. Doesn't work, like not even close. Um, really confusing too, because we're like, ads suck. Like this is all targeted and it's really good, but. People weren't clicking through, and the only way for the advertiser to get paid is if the person actually went through an e-commerce flow. And it turns out that banner ads are awful for e-commerce, other than retargeting. And retargeting isn't really banner ads. It's, it's different. But we looked at this, and we said, OK, is there something we can tune or tweak? Like, we shouldn't just give up yet. Like, this could still work. And we let the team play with a whole bunch of different ideas, different channels, different ways of doing it. You can't really come back from, a like, you're off by, a, like, two orders of magnitude. I'm sorry. So very quickly, we shut the business down. Unfortunately, this amazing team in New York, we laid them off. Like, just It was brutal, but we were, that's an expensive team to have. So we moved on. Act two. There's not 100 acts, but there's way more than you'd like to see here. <laughs> Act two. Um, while we were doing all this, mobile was really fascinating. It was ju just starting to come out, and we were amazed how many people would just like download an app that does like nothing. And we're like, OK. Um, <laughs> Maybe there's something here because everyone was active on our mobile stuff. The unit economics still didn't work on, on Act 1, but maybe we need to focus there. What's one of the major problems of someone actually doing e-commerce in mobile was um, getting someone to type in their credit card and all that information was ridiculous on mobile. Like it had a really poor conversion rate when you get to checkout flows. So we said, maybe this is the area we can focus in on and fix. Um, we went and we talked to folks. We built this app that was essentially, you know, equivalent of just like a mobile only PayPal. Um, and you didn't even log in. Like you just, it was just, everything was one click. It all knew who you were. Kind of like what Android Pay and, and uh, Apple Pay eventually launched. So think of that, but before those. All right. Went to the e-commerce companies. Were they interested? Yeah, they were interested in anything mobile. They were just like, my mobile's going through the roof. Anything mobile is great. I don't even know what's going on. I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's, it's going up. Uh, consumers, they were downloading every single app. Like It could do nothing, and they would download these apps. Um, was it easy to buy and use? Well, changing a person's checkout flow is actually not as easy as, as one would think. Um, and so we gave them, I mean, we're good at software, but we gave them ways of thinking about doing it. But their checkout flows were fairly rigid as far as how that would work. And we needed them to kind of bounce from one app to another to make it one click. And so it was, it was a little bit tough for them to really think about. Um, and then on the consumer side, you needed them to get to enter all their information in that very first time. So they didn't even get value until the second time they used it. Well, if most of the e-commerce guys we were working with were going to only get a buyer once, then asking them to put their information in that first time to sort of build your, your, your Apple Pay or your, 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 uh, 
Google Pay uh, experience wasn't really going to work. So um, we actually never even got to the unit economics evaluation um, because as we were going along this path, we got sucked into this uh, different business. But the reality is this wasn't going to work, not, not as a startup. I, I think even, even Apple Pay and Google are, are struggle a bit to make it a, a, a really great business without years of work. Act three. Um, while we were doing the wallet, uh, we started getting a lot of interest for like, how can you make your wallet pay at a point of sale system? I'm like, I, I don't know, we've never done anything with point of sale system. Um, and so we, we, we came up with this idea of actually building an open platform point of sale system so people like us could actually connect with a point of sale system. So there actually was a way for people to build apps that connected in. Um, and, and we went out there and we said, okay, small business owners, they, they have the majority of these businesses. Um, are they willing to talk to us about it? Yeah, they're, they they won't answer emails. They're 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 not in front of a computer all day, but they'll pick up the phone and they'll talk to you, and you can have a rich conversation and learn what their pain points are and their problems, and that's a huge part. Like I said, it's not just about them picking up the phone, but that you're learning and figuring out whether you can solve their problems. The second was it was really easy for them to make the, the purchase decision. So after they talk to you, I mean, you didn't have to necessarily even go on site at all. You could you could literally make that sale. Um, and they were the decision maker, they could make that happen. And then the last piece is unit economics. Um, and this one I need to talk, this one is where scale does actually matter. Uh, but it worked here because they were willing to pay for the equipment and they were, you get this recurring revenue stream. So there was generally the bones of everything you need here. So we got to this stage and we're like, okay, now we actually need to think about scale. So that's what I mean by like scale. I didn't really come in and tell you, well, what are all the steps you need to do to scale? Because I think the biggest problem we mostly have as startups is when we switch from that mode and where we say, okay, now let's pour gasoline on it. Let's go ask the venture capital community to give us millions of dollars because we're going to hire the, all these people who are great at scaling. It's really hard to get to this stage. And this is what you should be spending the vast, vast majority of your time on um, uh, to get to that next stage. Okay, so next stage. Now we were at this stage as Clover, what do we do? Because it still costs a huge amount to build a nationwide sales. So small businesses, you're still having to pick up the phone and call a lot of people. Um, or we need to find a partner that could give us the channel to get to these same customers. All right, so these were our two choices. We could go either way. Um, spoiler alert, we went with this approach, the partner, uh, partner with the channel. And the reason we did was because there was an appropriate partner out there. It doesn't work this way with actually a lot of industries, but there was for this industry. Why? Because there were these huge payment processors that were out there with huge sales teams, and they were all selling the same product. They were like reprogramming your card terminals, and that was like, I'll get you a slightly better rate. And that was the entire industry, basically. Um, and so they didn't have any differences between their products. They were all undercutting each other. And then Square's coming in, and, and Square's actually not even e eating into most of their businesses. They're mostly brick and mortar, but it's scaring, scaring like, the bejesus out of them. They're, they're freaking out because they're like, what happens if Square comes after my, my customers next? So we had this opportunity to go talk to all of these people. And, and initially, I, I was like, oh, how are we going to get in the door? And my co-founder's like, why don't we just email like the CEO and the CTO? And I'm like, why would they take a call from a startup? He's like, well, I'm going to go do it. And he goes and does it and he gets all these meetings. And I'm like, damn it. I was supposed to be the business guy. <laughs> You're supposed to build the product. And I'm sucking at the business side. You're doing a great job. But, but it was that much of a problem for them that they were willing to really have that conversation. Um, and so we got to very senior levels at that point, which is what you need for any deal where you're actually going to rely on someone for your channel. Um, and, and it did work out. So this is we, we ended up ultimately selling to one of our channels, First Data Corporation. Um, but this is fun because my, here's my, my co-founder with his, you know, his fists up. He's standing next to the CTO, uh, CEO of First Data. And they were just at the New York Stock Exchange because they crossed the one million um, hardware shipment mark. And, and I'm guessing this year they'll be bigger than uh, Square on total payment volume. And uh, it was just a lot of fun. Um, but this worked. It doesn't always work this way. But we made this choice on that sort of scaling side after we'd had all those first three checkpoints done. The last thing I want to mention is you don't always have this case. So what are some of the things you have to think about there? I'm not going to argue that I'm the, the best at this. Um, I'm, I'm going to say that I'm learning this all the time, constantly as I go. And the way I learn it is like I bring certain people on as advisors or board members. So like right now, I have a much more enterprisey type of um, product with, without necessarily the same channel approach. And uh, so I brought on a guy who had built up parametric sales teams and then you know, uh, VMware and sits on the boards of Atlassian and other things like that. And I said, please join my board so I can learn from you. 
um, and another guy who comes in and just really kicks the crap out of us on the sales and building sales up um, and thinking about it. I'm going to share, frankly, I'm going to steal from them and share what I'm learning from them, um, which is, one, uh, once you're kind of building sales up, it's, it's more like you have to think about manufacturing. And if you haven't done manufacturing, the challenge with manufacturing lines is it's not like you're just hacking stuff out. Like you kind of have to think through the whole thing and line it up um, and build a, a bit of a machine to it. And there's a, there's, a, there's a real science and expertise that goes into people who build great sales organizations up. And they have all their different techniques that they use. But, um, but you need to think of it that way. So you just don't hire just a random person here and a random person there. You really need to hire somebody who's actually able to think through, like, how would I change my messaging? And how would I change the different approaches I, I talk to the customer? And how do I get the dialogue going? And then how do I give you that feedback so you can make the product better? Um, versus just the person who just gets out there and, and is just, you know, just making lots of phone calls, but can't reposition what he's saying. So when we started Markov, I brought in a salesperson early on who was from the industry, and I kept noticing, like, when as we were shifting, he just kept saying the same pitch and the same thing again and again. He couldn't figure out how to change what he was saying, um, and that didn't work. Uh, and so I had to let him go and bring in somebody who I pulled from Lyft, who who just was much more experienced at managing teams and building that out and being able to understand how to craft that. So don't, don't hire that. Um, hi, and then that means also you're hiring a sales leader who knows how that machine works and knows how to think about it. Um, and the last one that was really interesting was uh, that I learned is don't just assume you hire a salesperson and all of a sudden they're just, they take care of sales. Actually, the very first thing you want to do when you hire your, your first salesperson or your sales lead is like send them a bunch of leads. Like it's a machine. It's not a cold start process. So you're, you're trying to put the leads in there, so they're having a good success, and they're working through it. They, they're tuning it, but you got to feed that machine. Um, and once you do, the, a great sales team can do amazing, amazing things. It, it, it really is remarkable. And I think in Silicon Valley, we totally underestimate the importance of sales and what we do there. I'd say that 95% of the companies here fail not because your products aren't awesome, but because you actually do a crappy job on sales. Um, and sales doesn't mean like knocking on doors. It means understanding the customer's problems, figuring out how to get it in there, and then making sure the product actually matches and you can deliver on that value proposition. So anyway, um, that's I think that's all I have here on the slide. So um, I'm going to pause there and maybe just take a couple of questions. Yeah, we have time for about two or three questions. I'm just curious how long it took you to, you know, um, iterate through rounds one and two of Clover, <laughs> and then also, you know, capital that went into that. How did yeah. you sort of manage all of that? Yeah. Uh, so I usually bias almost on going, well, I've had some startups that haven't gone as well as I'd like. My very first company I started was an instant messenger. Before they called it instant messaging, you know, ICQ beat us. Um, but we were there. Um, I started a, a, a user-generated content site that allowed you to do photos and videos and text, you know. But it was too early, and I made a whole bunch of mistakes. Um, almost every time I've made an error in my past, it's been overthinking things. So like that slide that was up earlier where it's like smart people kind of like go after the hard problems because they think the easy ones are too easy, so don't do it. Totally true. And my first couple startups, total failure, you know, mis miserable failures because I overthought it. Wrote my business plans, did all those things, overthought it like crazy. Um, so the number one thing is, is usually the answer's pretty much right there in your face. The harder part is when can your team get there and do you need to scale back the team? And then with the core team, how long does it take to, them to get there? So like with that first one, I was ready within a month, less than a month after we launched, because I could tell the numbers were so far off. And I'd done enough with product, I'm like, this isn't going to work. But I, if I, I knew that if I didn't let the team go through and iterate and try some product changes to see if it could work. And so I was very supportive of them to do that. But that even in that, that was like an extra two months. So I'm good at launching products fast, so it's like, Six months from start to where are they out there with 400 deals, all you know, four million visitors, all that. Within a month, you're like, shit, this isn't working. And then another month after that, you know, you've given the team enough time to iterate, and then you're like, we're switching now. Um, so that was maybe eight months total. I was ready to do it in basically six months, maybe a little past six months. Uh, the second one was very similar in that nature. Um, your second question: How do you manage money? I burned through it all. Um, I, I didn't manage my money uh, very well there, and, and this is always a challenge because 
um, you want to have this confidence that you have the right idea uh, and you want to go all in on it um, and you don't want to do a bad job. Uh, but no, I ended up, I, I went through $6 million and then I had to go borrow three, three million more, which I was fortunate enough to have good enough relationship with my investors to do that. But almost all the time that doesn't happen, right? Like one of my investors was Andreessen Horowitz, which is great, but they didn't lend me the extra money. One of my other investors lent me the extra money, right? Um, so, uh, the other point that was made earlier, like, don't run out of money. <laughs> like, that's kind of your job as CEO, don't run out of money. Um, uh, at the same time, I'm not going to say it's easy, like, you, you also don't want to sit there and, you know, VCs in the, the Bay Area aren't here to put a l money into something and say, go at it for 20 years and let's see what happens at the end of 20. So you do have the time pressure, it's not fair, it's the reality, but, um, but make your decisions as fast as you can learn, and then, as the point was made earlier, just make the cuts and make them, you know, we, we cut from 30 people to six people for that first change. Uh, we kept the core core really great engineering team and said, let's go figure out the next thing to do. And everyone that wasn't core to that capability was, we had, we let go. And we, we, we essentially kind of did it twice um, in about two eight month periods. And then it all worked really well. It was awesome and it's great. And you'll all have an amazing time and it'll be success. So don't worry. Okay, question here. When the, when the capital got lean through some of the pivots and <coughs> reboots, did you put your own money in? Um, so I've put my own money into my own stuff before. Um, for Clover, I didn't have anywhere near enough capital to make any dent in it. Uh, for like my current startup, I've put a lot of my own money into it. Um, uh, the, so I, you know, as a philosophy, though, maybe the better better answer to that question is, is like philosophically, should you fund your own things with your own dime? Um, it depends on where you're at. If your money is like you could just go to Vegas and throw it on the tables, then put it into your own startup. If you don't feel that way and you're like, I got to put my kids through school or I got to do these other things, then don't do it. Investors are specifically saying, I'm putting my money on the table. That's what their job is. That's what they do. Um, be really careful. Uh, I've, I've had, you know, when, when we were doing that second round of Clover, I was paying myself a very low salary, and I did a previous startup before that that I paid myself no salary for. So towards the end of Clover, I was basically, I told my wife, we have to actually sell the house and go move somewhere else because we're, we're not poor because the houses here are super expensive, but, but we, we can't do this anymore. We're, our cash is going to zero, so we're going to have to go rent for a while. Um, and it turned out we didn't have to because uh, we ended up getting some success, but, um, but I've had that with my life where I, I go through zero cash and cash. What you don't ever want to do is get to the point where you're so panicked personally that you're actually making bad decisions for your own company. So you need to have enough comfort and sta stability if you're gonna if you're gonna be good at being a CEO or or anyone in a start any person in a startup. We have one last question. I actually very recently became aware of Markov ovens um, through a, 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 use, a, a very fanatical user of yours. And I think the thing that is really, truly astounding about this product is the people who know about it are crazy about it. Nice. Um, when you get to the point where you've, you've blown past gate one, you've blown past gate two, and you're standing there with Clover iteration one, and you're trying to figure out, Jesus, how do we make the economics of this work? I don't know if you've, you're, you've had that uh, kind of same process with Markov. I, I assume so, because hardware is hardware. Uh, hard, hardware is hard. Um, really, fundamentally, how do you make the choice, the product decisions around um, clearing that first gate and making unit economics work uh, by you know, potentially if it means compromising features, compromising those things that make people fanatical. Um, and it depends on the business you're in. Like, I'm in a hardware business now where I can't just tweak it and change it and move it around. It's really expensive anytime I change hardware. So I'm very, like, I, I do have to, if I'm going to pivot now, I have to pivot with an oven that cooks, right? Like, I can't, like, <laughs> change it to something. I can't, like, all of a sudden do something different. Like some manufacturing process or something. So, so um, with most people, though, they don't have hardware. Uh, and most people have software or services, and, and so you have some more flexibility there. Um, but but uh, um, 
my 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 take is is like once you do hardware, you it's it's really more about like tuning not the product anymore because like you kind of the product is what it is, and so now it's really about tuning like who you're going to serve. So just to give you a taste of it, I, I actually don't feel like I'm through all this with Markov at all by any means. Like when we first built the Markov oven, we went out and said. Let's go to all the big restaurant chains because we're going to save them on labor by automating everything, right? And we went into the doors, and these, and these guys, of course, when you're doing like an AI oven, everyone's like, totally want to see this thing, right? What is this? So you get in all these doors, and they're, they're articulating their problems kind of, kind of, but they're actually really bad at it. So you start realizing, wait a minute, something weird here. Like all these big restaurant chains you know, they don't know what's going on. Like they don't, and, and, then, and then we hit that second problem there, which was it's like an assembly line of complexity, like, like in a manufacturing line. You're like, wow, it's going to take them like two years to roll this out. And yeah, we might make 100 million off of a subway or this or that, but do we really have two years to do this? So we, we, even with that, we have to go through that process. But there you're tuning like who your customers are and who you're targeting and how you're getting it to them. Um, and so in hardware land, I'd say you have to do more of the tuning of who you're delivering to, like which customer base. In software land, you have a little more flexibility because you can actually go back and just redo your product. You're in that situation. You have to make the decision between, I have a way to make money fast right here in front of me, and I have my horizon, you know, the thing that maybe is my horizon three, but I don't know it yet. How do you make those Take decisions? Take the money fast. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, you have to be passionate about what you're going to do, but don't be married to the original plan. I mean, uh, like I said, like the only time I've ever had failures is where I was married to my plan. And then I, if I was refusing to make changes to my plan, but the, I, like the, 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 the solution was right there, just because you're not solving the problem you were maybe originally set out, but obviously you have to be passionate enough. You have to go in every day to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, when... when um, when we were doing this user-generated content site, uh, it was like, what if the content's really crappy then? Like, do we like that idea or not? Should we have our own filter as to what's going on there? And so, uh, but if that's, but, but think about it. The people who first used user-generated content sites were not like Stephen King, right? It was like all the people who couldn't be Stephen King wanted to use these things. So, um, so your, your original vision might not be there, but if you find the problem, like when we did Clover, the point of sale guy started coming to us saying, connect your wallet to us. And we're like, I don't really know what you're talking about. We didn't set out to build the point of sale system, but it was clear there was demand there. They could articulate it. There was a market there. So my, my point about you, if someone's offering you money, it means kind of like, wait a minute, they, they see value there. If someone's offering you money for something, there's value. Now, whether or not that's actually for your product or, hey, be a professional services team for us, that's very different, right? Like custom build us something is different than I'm buying your product. But if they're offering you money for your product in a different way than you expected, uh, think about whether there's a whole business line there. Like go do this exercise again. Okay, I think we need yeah. to wrap up our Sorry. program. Thank you so much, Leonard. Yeah. That was Thanks. awesome.